Good evening and welcome to Grow to Go Christian Center's Tuesday night Bible study. Get ready for another message from God, another powerful teaching. Tonight we're going to do part three of our sessions on angels. And the title of this message is Angels, once again, Heaven's FedEx System, part three. Once again, Angels, FedEx, I mean Heaven's FedEx System, part three. Now, the purpose of the message, once again, is to give the believer a clear understanding of the existence of angels and the benefits that they are to the believer, okay? And our golden objective is that the believer will be able to know when to use and dispatch the angels of the Lord in their prayer time, okay? Now, so, once again, grace, peace, mercy be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and risen Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what we're going to do today, I'm going to do a little review of parts one and two, and I want to get into some nuggets, some additional nuggets of the steps of praying and using the angels and the prayers that are needed that you use angels in. Because every single prayer, you don't need the angels. But if you have prayers that require the use of angels and you don't use them, you could delay, hold up, and even stop your prayer from coming to pass. And you don't want to do that, okay? All right. Now, every prayer that you pray is a faith prayer, a prayer of faith. It should be a prayer of faith. Now, in faith, there is always a process when you're praying. So once again, when you're praying, always use the Word of God. And you have to find your answer in the Word of God. Find the Word of God that is in line with your prayer request. Okay. Now, what we're going to do first, we're going to look at uh, we said what an angel is. We said now the angel is a messenger sent by God, by man, or by Satan. Yes, Satan does send his angels, his lying demons that will go out there and to deceive you. Okay, Because remember, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, John 10.10. 10, and he uses his angels to do that. Okay. Secondly, we said an angel is a messenger referring to a pastor. So me, myself, being an assistant pastor of the church, I am an angel with a message from God sent to you, okay? Now, we said also, an angel is superior to man, belonging to heaven, belonging to God, and engaged in his service. So the angels are servants of God as well as servants of the heirs of salvation, okay? Now, angels are spirits not having material bodies, okay? They don't have material bodies as man does. Now, but angels are either human in form or can assume the human form when necessary. And we looked at Luke 24, verses 3 and 4, and Acts 10, verses 3 and verse 30. Now, angels also are called holy. Of course, because God is holy, his angels have to be holy. Because God tells us to be holy before our God is holy. So as we represent God in the earth realm, we also must represent a person that is of holy attributes. Okay? And now, I have a Christian dictionary. And the Christian dictionary has a unique definition of angels that's very powerful. It says an angel is a spirit and a supernatural being who continually worships and serves God in heaven and who is sent into the world from time to time as his messenger to inform God's people and to comfort and minister to them. Okay? Now, angels appear to shepherds in the fields announcing the birth of Jesus. That's found in Luke 2, verses 8 through 14. Angels also announce his resurrection him being risen from the dead, which is found in Luke 24, verses 5 through 7. They announced that Jesus would return again in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Angels are personal, sinless, immortal beings existing in great numbers and in close retention with individual men and women throughout the history of God's kingdom. Angels, they have great strength, intelligence, and wisdom far superior to that of human beings. 
They are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 14. Now, we also see in our Google definition, Google says that angels are spiritual beings intermediate between God and man. And intermediate simply means coming between two things in time, place, order, and character. Okay? Now, since these angels are for the heirs of salvation, we need to find out who are the heirs of salvation. And we found out that those that are born again are the heirs of salvation. Now, we found that in Romans 8, verses 14 through 17, Galatians 3, 26 through 29, and Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Now, what we want to do today is kind of expound on the steps of prayer because I want to make sure that you're praying the steps to get your prayers answered. Because once again, every prayer is of faith, but there's a faith, there's a process when you pray in faith. In fact, every principle, every promise, and every prophecy that God has for us is obtained through a faith process. Now, so first of all, when you have a situation, you want to make sure that you find your situation in God's word. Every concern known to man is in the word of God. So therefore, if you can't find it, feel freely to call the church. Church number 314-867-1894. Someone there can help you out at all times when you're having problems look, locating your situation. Okay. Now, after you find your situation in the word of God, God says, put him in remembrance of his word. For example, if you're praying for a, a car or something, Father, you said in your word, ask and you shall receive. So, Father, I'm asking. I'm asking. So, therefore, you have to say something. You have to communicate with God. Okay? The book of Hebrews tells us he that comes to God must believe that he is. You must believe that he exists. Okay? Because it says also without faith it's impossible to please God. So, you have to use faith. In your prayer transaction, okay? In your faith transaction, you're using faith because you're believing God for something that you don't have, but you believe that He can bring it to pass, okay? Now, you pray, you pray, excuse me, you pray to your Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus. You don't pray to Jesus, you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. That's step three. So, for, okay, let's go back to the first step. First step, find your situation in God's Word. Second step, pray. I mean, put God in remembrance of his word. In the third step, pray to your heavenly father in the name of Jesus. Now, let's expound on that a little bit more. Let's go to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And we're going to refer to, let's go to verse 22. Verse 22, Mark chapter 11. It says, And Jesus answering said to them, Have faith in God. Or either have the God kind of faith. It says, verse 23, For verily I say to you, that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. That's the key. When you're praying to God, you can't doubt. Because it says, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So let's address doubt. If you're doubting, you can't receive from God because when you're doubting, you're telling God you don't believe what he says. You're not sure. See, the word of God is truth. You have to stand on the word of God regardless of what the situation looks like, feels like, or appears to be because we walk by faith. Romans 10, 17. Uh, no, no, it's not wrong scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, so we walk by faith and not by sight. So we're not moved by what we see. We move by only what we say. What we say is what we believe, and what we believe is the Word of God. So you have to speak the Word of God, believing it at all times, okay? Now, verse 24 says, Therefore, I say to you, with things soever, that leaves it open, with things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. It says, and when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. So once again, when you do pray, if you have ought against somebody, you have to ask for forgiveness first because you can't go to God and you've got unforgiveness in your heart because that's a prayer blocker. So you don't want nothing to block your prayer. 
It says, and when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So you reap what you sow. If you don't forgive, God can't forgive you, okay? So we want to leave the prayer line completely open with no bumps or bruises in the road, okay? Now, we go to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. Now, Genesis chapter 8, Genesis chapter 8 tells us that it says, verse 22, Genesis 8, 22, it says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So we want to focus on, he said, seed time and harvest. So when you're praying a prayer, you're planting a seed. Your prayer goes up to the Father. Your prayer is processed. And then it is dispatched by the angels. But you must do that yourself. Now, you can't get, sometimes people begin to doubt because of the time length that it takes. I don't want you to doubt because it takes a long time. All you have to do is just continue to pray and confess that you believe that that answer is coming. That's part of our uh, 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 steps that we're going to, going to do. Now, once again, I said you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, okay? Now, in, when it says seed, time, and harvest shall never cease, we're going to break down seed, time, and harvest. Seed is the time when you're sowing the prayer, when you're planting the prayer. Time is the process, when it's processing. And harvest is the manifestation. It's just like if you send off for something, a package or something, send off for a product or something, you go through Amazon, eBay, or whatever company that you're applying for a package. You order the package. They process the package. They give it to the deliverer, and the deliverer delivers the package. In this case, in heaven's FedEx system, the angels are the deliverer. They're going to deliver the package, which is your prayer, whatever you prayed for, whatever situation. For example, if you needed a car, if you needed some money, you go to the Father. Father, you said in your word, ask and I shall receive. Father, I need $1,000. You said, whatsoever thing I desire when I pray, if I believe I receive it, then I shall have it. So, Father, I ask for $1,000. I thank you, Father. I ask by faith. I believe by faith that I have that $1,000 in Jesus' name. Angels, I wish you to go forth and bring me my thousand dollars in Jesus' name. Father, I just thank you. I believe I have my thousand dollars in Jesus' name. So every day there's a confession of faith, a continuous confession. You continue to confess before until you possess it. Okay, because your confession brings possession. And the more you confess it, then your expectation will rise to the next level. Because in faith, you have to first believe and you have to trust in the thing that you're believing and then have confidence in what God's word says that it'll come to pass, that you do what it says. And after you do all that, then you begin to expect it, begin looking for it. If you're praying for a thought, you start checking the mailbox every day. Even on Sunday, when the mailman don't run, check the mailbox anyway. They could have ran and forgot that mail and dropped it in at 9 o'clock that night. And you went to bed and didn't know. Check the mailbox every day. You're looking for that $1,000. Now, you don't always know how God is going to bring it, but you just have to believe that what he said in his word will come to pass, that you do what it says and you expect it to come. And before you know it, that $1,000 will show up might be in the mail, somebody might give it to you, somebody might drive up and say, God told me to stop at this house with the red door and give you a thousand dollars. It don't matter. The Bible says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible, okay? So that's what you have to do. Now, always in your prayer in Jesus' name, because Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. He says, your Father, in the name of Jesus, I need a thousand dollars. I thank you, Father. I believe I have it. I lose the angels to go forth and cause it to happen in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father. I believe I have my thousand dollars right now in Jesus' name. See, it's a simple process. Now, after you've done that, you begin to thank God for the answer before manifestation of the prayer that you pray. You thank him because you're supposed to believe that you have it already. See it with the eyes of your faith. Not these eyes here, the eyes of your faith, your image, the imagination. Begin to see that $1,000. See it in your hand. See a check in your hand. See yourself cashing it at the bank. See it with the eyes of your faith. 
believe that you have it before you actually see the manifestation. That's faith, because if you see it, then you don't need faith. If it's something that you need and you see it right there, you don't need faith. Faith is used for something that you need, want to desire, but you don't have in manifestation. And you can't get it in the natural, so you need God's help. But God will never step in until you ask him. And when you're asking him, that's an act of prayer, okay? And you have to reach, and the angels are there to go forth and cause it to happen because they're ministering spirits sent forth to you, okay? Now, you continue your confession of faith until manifestation, okay? Now, I'm going to go over the steps real quick again. First step, find your situation in God's word. Secondly, put God in remembrance of his word. Third, pray to your heavenly father in the name of Jesus. Fourth, in your prayer in Jesus' name. Fifth, loose the angels from heaven to go forth and cause it to happen. Number six, begin to thank God for the answer before manifestation. Seven, continue your confession of faith until manifestation. Now, what, you, what I want you to do is create a prayer journal. Write down the day and the time that you prayed for something. And then when it manifests, you write that date down. This will begin to show you yourself how well you are doing in your prayer and asking for God. Because if you need $50,000 or if you need $1,000, you need to see if you got $1,000 faith or $50,000 faith. It'll show up as you begin to mature in your faith walk, okay? Because if Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, I mean Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, verse 6 says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your path, then that means you're communicating to God on a regular basis because faith is the believer's lifestyle. It's not something you pray just when you get in trouble, just when you come to church on Sunday. Faith is a lifestyle. Proverbs 3, 6, in all your ways, even if you're going something simple to the grocery store, going to the bathroom and you're at a big mall, which bathroom should I go to? God may send you somewhere on a certain assignment, okay? You have to be open to God. And that's another thing about prayer. Don't be locked in on, I got to pray in the morning, I got to pray in the evening. Be open to God praying and talking to you all throughout the day, not just limited to the daytime or the morning time, amen? All right. Now, what we want to look at now, we want to expound on the, the prayers that we pray that we use angels in. Now, I'm going to give you all the prayers again just for informational purposes. We had eight different types of prayer that believers should know about. We said the first prayer, the first prayer is the prayer of consecration and dedication. This was the prayer where you have total submission to God when believers decide to allow God to lead and guide them all the days of their life. Usually when you first get saved, you start letting God lead and guide you. Then sometimes you get comfortable, you start doing things your own, your own, your own. And then you only go to God when you get in trouble. No, you want God to lead you and guide you all the days of your life. You want total submission, total commitment to God. This is the prayer of consecration, dedication. This is where you pray to God that prayer. Father, I'm going to do it your way. I give it up. I'm, I'm canceling my ways. And I'm going to do it your way from now on. Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me in everything I say and do in Jesus' name. Okay? Write down Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 for that one. And Isaiah 119, Isaiah 119 says, and if you be willing and obedient, you eat the good of the land. So it takes your will. God gives you self-will. You can choose what you want to choose, but he wants you to choose his way of doing it. And that's when the blessings come. Okay, and that's when he begins to exalt you to another level. Now, second prayer is the prayer of commitment. Prayer of commitment is a promise of change and a challenge to the believer to commit to doing everything unto the Lord. Colossians 3.23 3 tells us that um, whatever you do, you do it unto the Lord. So when you, even you at work, when you at work for the man, you at work for the man, but you're doing it unto the Lord. So you do a class A job all the time, even if it's something you don't particularly like to do because God blessed you with the job and that's where your income comes from at this time, you do it unto the Lord, okay? Uh, write down Colossians 3.23 and Psalms 37.5. Now, our third, third prayer is the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith is an insurance 
of success in prayer that encourages the believer to believe that faith accomplishes whatever it sets out to do. Jesus told us in his word, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. And then in 1 John, write down 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, and James 5, 15. Now, once again, all prayers you pray should be prayed in faith. All prayers or should be prayed, all prayers should be in faith believing. Let me say it like that. All prayers should be in faith believing. Okay, the fourth prayer is the prayer of thanksgiving. The prayer of thanksgiving is an act of the believer's will, obedience, love, and appreciation for God's unconditional love, grace, mercy, and blessing that God has provided for them. Okay? Write down 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, and Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. Now, these prayers are prayers that you pray to God. You don't necessarily need the use of angels. Okay? These are... You praying to God, recognizing Him, just you and God, okay? Now, the, uh, next, the next four prayers are prayers where you would have use of the angels. Petition prayer is the believer's request to God to meet a want, need, or desire in an act of faith, believing that God will bring it to pass. Now, we read Mark 11, 22 to 24, and let's look at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, let me see here, in Luke chapter 11, let's drop down to verses, uh, let's read verse 9 and 10, in Luke chapter 11, verse 9 and 10 says, and I say to you, ask and it shall be, when God uses the word shall, that's an automatic, automatic guarantee from God, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. For everyone that asks receives. For he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be open. Once again, God saying, ask and you shall receive. Now the book of James tells us you have not because you ask not. Or you ask with the wrong intention or the wrong understanding. Or using it the wrong way. Okay? Now, let's look at... Um, Number six, our sixth type of prayer, which is the prayer of agreement. The prayer of agreement. The prayer in the prayer of agreement, a believer being in total agreement with another believer that God will meet that believer's request as if it was their own request. So when somebody says, Man, be in agreement with me, you have to be in agreement with them to the point that you really want them to get that prayer answered as if it was you meeting, meeting, needing that, that, that prayer answered, okay? Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 18 real quick. Matthew chapter 18. And we'll look at verses uh, 19 and 20. Matthew 18, 19 and 20. And Jesus says, Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it will be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So God just wants you to be in agreement and he wants you to believe that he will bring it to pass. Sometimes you need the encouragement of another believer. Okay. Call one another up. If somebody asks you to be in agreement with me, call them up and see how they're doing. Tell them, you, I'm still standing. I'm still praying with you. I believe you have that thing that you're praying. I believe you have that thousand dollars. I believe you got that new car. I believe you got that new house. Jesus name. I believe they're going to call you about it any minute in Jesus' name. You encourage one another. Now, okay, number seven, the seventh prayer is intercessory prayer. Now, this is done a lot by many churches. Intercessory prayer is praying in groups. Now, you can intercede yourself. You can intercede with another person. You can intercede with a group. A lot of churches do groups of intercession. intercession intercessory prayer is praying to God on behalf of others, standing in the gap for others, taking hold of God's will and not letting go until it comes to pass, praying in the spirit which is praying one of the perfect prayers, okay? Praying in the Spirit means praying in other tongues, okay? 
I don't have time to go into that, but when a person is born again and filled with Holy Spirit, God gives you a prayer language. And in that prayer language, it helps you out in your prayers so that sometimes you don't know exactly how to pray in a situation, but you, if you pray in tongues, you pray in the perfect prayer, okay? So when you get a group of people interceding, we're taking care of all kinds of business and we're doing it in faith because when you pray in other tongues, the Bible says, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, you don't know what you're saying. But because God gave you the language, he understands it. He doesn't need no interpretation. He gives you the language, so therefore he knows exactly what you're saying, and it pushes the devil out the way. He can't stop it. You can't mess it up because you don't know what you're saying. The devil can't stop it because he don't know what you're saying. So it's the perfect prayer right up to God, and he'll take care of business. Amen. Now, just, just for scripture purposes, Romans 15, verse 1. Romans 15, verse 1. In fact, let's turn to that one. Romans 15, plus 1. I mean, verse 1. I'm talking about plus 1. Not adding. It's not the, not, the, not the class, the math class. Okay, Romans 15, 1 says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So God says also in Philippians chapter 2, look not only on the things of yourself, but also on the things of others. It says, let this man be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. So therefore, God expects you to be mature enough to, if you see another brother struggling, don't talk about him saying that he's stupid, he don't know what he's talking about. You're supposed to stand in the gap for your brother, stand in the gap. And that's where uh, intercession comes in, standing in the gap for others, okay? Now, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel 22. And let's drop down to, drop down to verse 30. Verse 30. Ezekiel 22, 30 says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. So through intercession, we're standing in the gap for others. We're praying for situations that other people need, maybe even in another country, another state. We're standing in the gap for others. So therefore, in the intercessory prayer, after you get through intercession, I loose the angels in heaven to go forth and cause everything we pray for to happen. Because in intercession, we may pray 10 or 15 prayers. So we need the angels to go forth and cause it to happen. Everything that, that, that the angels can go forth and cause to happen, we intercede for that, okay? Because we're praying the perfect prayer. But, but uh, intercessory prayer, standing in the gap. You want to make sure you get that into your prayer life. In the last prayer is spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare. Now, when you get enrolled, when you become born again, you actually step into the army of the Lord, okay? You become a warrior, and you got to get strong. You got to build yourself up. But spiritual warfare is prayer that takes place in the spiritual world where the battles of our own life, our families, our friends, and our nation are won, okay? And also the spiritual battle against spiritual wickedness in the spirit realm. Okay, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6 for this one. Ephesians chapter 6. Because people, the devil works through people trying to make you think it's the person. But it's actually the devil working through that person. And if you don't understand it, you get mad at that person. You may hit that person. You may even kill that person. Because you thought it was them, but it was the devil working through them. That's why we have to know spiritual wickedness comes from the devil working through people. Because, well, let's read the scripture. The scripture tells us, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and upon his might. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the wiles, the tricks and devices. Verse 12 is the, is the kicker. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So when God tells us that, that's letting us know that people are not our problem. It's the devil and them demon spirits that's working through people. That's where our problem is. And if we don't know how to do spiritual warfare, the devils will win, okay? Now, 
Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's go to 10. Chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And let's drop down to verse 3. Verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalt itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into capity, captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Okay? So, God is telling us that our weapons of warfare are not carnal. So we don't get a bat and start hitting the boss at work because he made you mad. Okay? The boss acting up at work, go in the bathroom. Satan, I break your powers over my boss in Jesus. Now, you cannot cause him to rise up against me in the name of Jesus. I lose the peace of God over my boss right now in Jesus' name. Angels, I lose you to go forth and minister to him in Jesus' name. See? You have to have the wisdom and knowledge of God to take authority over that position. Because, see, if you don't do that, that's why the guys, they call it, they, they went postal. They went and got their, their assault rifle, came up and shot 10, 15 people. All, and all it was, it was the devil working through somebody at work and made the guy mad. And he didn't understand this right here. He didn't understand the word of God. So he did it on his own. It says our weapons of warfare are not carnal. So we don't take out the knife. We don't take out the pistol. We don't take out the bat and beat up the people at work. Okay. We beat the devil in our prayer time. Amen. Okay. Now, let's look at one more thing. Before we close out. And. Let me see here. I have my notes here. My notes. Okay, yeah. In our. In our foundation scripture. Uh, let me see. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer or allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with, the key word is with, the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear. So God knows everything. He's everywhere all the time. So he knew you was going to be challenged with that situation. So he already had the answer. But Jesus says, the father knoweth what you have need of before you ask. So therefore, you got to say something. So therefore, God has the answer to your problem. But you must petition God for it and loose the angels to cause it to come to pass. So therefore, the answer is always there. So whatever situation you get into, remember, God always has the answer. He's already provided the answer. So therefore, you have nothing to fear because God has the answer to everything you want, you need, and desire. Okay? Now, I won't take it for granted that everybody is born again. So therefore, I want to offer you a prep salvation because you don't have access to the angels unless you're born again, okay? So, God says in his word, if you call upon him, he will not cast you out, but he will take you in. So, we have to thank him for that. He said in his word in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So, what I want you to do is repeat this prayer after me. Dear God in heaven, I come to you. In the name of Jesus, you said in your word, if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, I would be saved. So I believe in my heart and I'm confessing now with my mouth that Jesus is the son of God. He died for my sins. He was raised from the dead for my justification. And I receive him right now as my Lord and Savior. You also said in your word that if I would ask for Holy Spirit, you would give him to me. So I'm asking you now to fill me with Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come inside me. 
lead me, guide me, anoint me, empower me, and direct my life so I may live for God. Reveal to me God's plan and purpose for my life here on earth. Thank you, Father, for saving me. Thank you for filling me with the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Okay then, since you prayed that prayer, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we believe you're born again and you're filled with Holy Spirit. So now you have access to God, access to Holy Spirit, and access to the angels. That's part of your salvation package. So if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we want you to call the number in the bottom of the screen, 314-867-1894. And the secretary will lead and guide you and give you some information about the salvation you just received. And if this message has been a blessing to you, we want to give you an opportunity to sow a seed. Once again, call that same number, 314-867-1894. Or you can go to our website, www the letter G, the number 2, GCC.org. And you can give your love offering right there. And members and family members, continue to sow your seed, pay your tithes, give offerings, because you're doing a great job during this pandemic episode that, we, we, that we're going through. So continue to be obedient to the Word of God. You're doing a great. And uh, remember to keep God first in your life. Stay blessed. Stay safe. And pray every day. And I'll see you next time with another powerful message from God. Until then, be blessed. Love you.